I think uh, we should go ahead and get started this evening. Um, uh, let me just begin by saying good evening and welcome to tonight's presentation of the Lake Charlevoix Watershed Green Stormwater Infrastructure Planning for Boyne City, Charlevoix and East Jordan. My name is Jennifer Buchanan. I'm the Watershed Protection Director at Tip of the Mint Watershed Council. I wanna thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, we will go ahead and get started, but first I wanna mention that this webinar is being recorded. You've all been muted, uh, but we do welcome questions and comments. If you would like to ask a question at any point, uh, please do so using the chat function. We will be monitoring the chat box and we'll have a chance to answer questions after each speaker. If you have any technical difficulties along the way, you may also use the chat box and we'll try to address that issue as soon as possible. The purpose of the project um, that you're listening to tonight was to assess opportunities for integrating green stormwater infrastructure with existing gray stormwater infrastructure in the three Lake Charlevoix communities, including Boyne City, Charlevoix, and Stored. Green stormwater infrastructure can extend the life of gray infrastructure and enhance treatment of stormwater before being discharged into nearby surface waters. This project combines the talents and interests of green stormwater infrastructure experts, city staff and community members to better understand how green stormwater infrastructure can be applied for water quality protection and beautification of these communities. We originally anticipated having in-person community engagement sessions to receive feedback from community residents, but given the need for social distancing, we are presenting to you tonight virtually instead. So once again, we appreciate you tuning in and encourage you to share the link to the story map and survey so that other community members will have the chance to learn about green stormwater infrastructure and weigh in on their preferences for these communities. At the end of tonight's presentation, my colleague Ashley will provide you uh, with all you need to know how to access the information online in the future. I wanna acknowledge uh, the city managers, Tom, Mike, and Mark of East Jordan, Boyne City, and Charlevoix, respectively, for their partnership in this project. We thank you for your interest, and I hope this project is the first of many in promoting green stormwater infrastructure in the Lake Charlevoix watershed. I also want to recognize the Coastal Management Program, Water Resources Division of the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes, and Energy and the Charlevoix County Community Foundation for providing the grant support without which none of this would have been possible. So thank you all very much. Next. Just to kind of go over briefly what we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, we anticipate our presentation will take us close to about 7 p.m. We will hear from a few different folks. As you can see on the agenda, you will learn what is green stormwater infrastructure, the work done as part of this project, and the options to weigh in on what you believe would be good options for your community. We will also learn a bit about how other Northern Michigan communities are moving forward with implementing green stormwater infrastructure. Before I turn it over to our next presenter, Madeline from the Michigan Department of Envir Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, I wanna First, give you a little background on Drummond Carpenter, the firm, the engineering firm, who's done a terrific job helping us bring to fruition what we believe are some great green stormwater infrastructure options for these communities. First of Drummond Carpenter, Don Carpenter is a professional engineer and accredited green design professional whose expertise includes green stormwater infrastructure, stormwater best management practices, hydrologic modeling and design, and field data collection. Dr. Carpenter has over 20 years of experience working with diverse clients across the United States as a researcher and practicing professional. His efforts have focused on researching innovative stormwater management practices and designing stormwater management retrofits for nonprofit organizations and local municipalities. Dr. Carpenter also serves as the director of the Great Lakes Stormwater Management Institute at Lawrence Technological University, where he's been on the faculty since 2000. 
In this capacity, he conducts research on stormwater dust management practices, teaches civil engineering, design and leadership courses, provides professional lectures and short courses on innovative stormwater management, and advises communities on how to implement green stormwater infrastructure. Don's colleague joining us tonight, um, also of Drummond Carpenters, Rachel Pishek is a project engineer and she's a multidisciplined professional with a master's in civil engineering, a bachelor's in civil engineering, and a bachelor's in architecture. Rachel uh, is experienced with water resources, green infrastructure design, stormwater best management practices, hydrologic modeling and design, community planning and placemaking. Rachel also happens to live in Northern Michigan and has personal ties to the lake uh, Lake Charlotte Watershed and knows these three communities very well. Next. And also our organization, Tip of the Mint Watershed Council. We were formed in 1979. We are a membership-based environmental nonprofit dedicated to protecting our lakes, streams, wetlands, and groundwater through respected advocacy, innovative education, technically sound water quality monitoring, thorough research and restoration activities. We achieve our mission by empowering others and we believe in the capacity to make a positive difference. We work locally, regionally, and throughout the Great Lakes Basin to achieve our goals. We currently have a staff of 11 and our offices are based in Petoskey. However, as you can see by the map shown, our service area covers much of the Northern Lower Peninsula the four major watersheds where we work are shaded on the map, including the Lake Charlevoix watershed, which is shown in brown between the Elk River Chain of Lakes watershed and the Little Traverse Bay watershed. I'm going to turn everything over to Don Carpenter. I already introduced Don and Rachel of Drummond Carpenter. So, um, Don, I will turn it over to you if you want to share your screen. And, yes, I will. Thank you. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? About the right volume? Yep, sounds great. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, Madeline, uh, for the background information and the supporting this program. So I'm going to share my screen to get started here. Always takes a couple of clicks. Okay. Can you confirm ver uh, verbally for me? You can see the screen now. Are you muted? Can you confirm for me verbally that you can see the screen? Yes. We yes, can. we can. Awesome. Thank you. I'll make sure. All right. So today uh, we're going to be discussing the Lake Charlevoix Green Storm Infrastructure Public Visioning Session. And uh, as was mentioned before, uh, Rachel uh, has really spearheaded a lot of this work. Uh, in the interest of, of timing, I'm going to be doing um, all the presenting so we don't have to go back and forth between two different presenters. But uh, you know, Rachel really led a lot of the uh, efforts on this project. So we're going to talk a little bit about green stormwater infrastructure, just what it is, just kind of give you a flavor for it. And then I'm going to go specifically into the Lake Charlotte watershed and show you some of the visioning that we've done for the three communities. We worked hand in hand with Boyne City, Charlevoix, and East Jordan. We've met with uh, some of the public officials there and um, we spent a lot of time in each of these communities trying to identify best practices. We'll go into a little bit more detail on that later. And then uh, Drummond Carpenter has been, uh, been quite blessed to have worked with multiple communities in northern Michigan. So we'll highlight a couple of case studies from some work we did with the Watershed Center of Grand Traverse Bay for regional implementation projects that really started very similar to the way this project was. So I'm going to try to tie those regional implementation projects kind of back to this project. And then we'll wrap up with a little bit of Q&A. So what is green stormwater infrastructure? You've already heard this quite a bit, but effectively, I just like to say that green stormwater infrastructure is really just using mother nature to manage rainfall runoff, right? If we can mimic mother nature, promote evapotranspiration, promote habitat, um, increase infiltration of runoff, all of the water then that gets to Lake Charlevoix and the other receiving streams uh, in the watershed, 
will end up being a lot cleaner. And so that's really what we're, we're shooting for you. It's really a simple definition. So some of the techniques at our disposal, we have uh, bioretention cells and rain gardens. We have uh, vegetated swales and bioswales, planter boxes, street trees, infiltration galleries and swales, permeable pavement. And so I'm just gonna give a, a couple examples of each because what I really wanna spend most of our time doing is, is looking at the visioning, but I think you should understand or have a common knowledge of these techniques before I do that. So a rain garden is, like, is really a landscaping feature. Uh, these are shallow depressional areas. Uh, they typically have amended soils. So you might have compost or wood chips amended with the native soils. You use native plantings in them because native plants have deep roots that promote infiltration and can resist drought. So they don't need as much tending to. But uh, these really can be done at, at, at the home level scale, or the site specific scale. Sorry about that. Um, bioretention cells are basically much larger engineering, um, engineered systems. So these are going to have under drains, curb cuts, overflows, uh, a lot more um, substantial engineering goes into bioretention cells. They're typically part of municipal planning projects and uh, re really require like an, uh, an engineer to sign and seal the plan. So Bioretention cells and rain gardens uh, have very similar functions and features. Um, however, you know, like I said, the real difference is one is more of a homeowner landscaping feature and the other is part of like a community master plan. Vegetated swales and bioswales, these are very, very similar. To, these are basically linear rain gardens or uh, uh, kind of linear bioretention cells. So um, you have overflow of, uh, what you have is curb cuts that allow water to go in and then overflow uh, basins at the end of it. So it's like linearly conveying water from point A to point B. If you actually look at most infrastructure in the past, that would be gray infrastructure. These would be done with curb and gutters and pipes. And so what we're doing is using nature-based solutions and vegetation and uh, conforming to the natural landscape instead of using pipes. Planter boxes, planter boxes can either be above grade or below grade. And these are basically rain gardens in a box. So you can see the picture here on the left, that is a below grade planter box. And you've got the little kind of curb cuts that the water can kind of go into. And then you can also have planter boxes along the front fascia of buildings. And so instead of these downspouts going straight into pipes, they uh, will go into overflow areas and then the, uh, you still get the opportunity for the plants to soak up those soils, evapotranspirate it, and then cleanse that water before it runs off. Street trees and tree box filters, these are actually different techniques. So a uh, street tree is, is really just that. It's any tree that's basically planted along a street front. The difference is that street trees really tend to only intercept the water or the rainfall that falls right on them. So it's really the kind of the direct interception. A tree box filter, on the other hand, takes runoff from parking lots or roads and directs them into the soil substrate around the tree. So you're um, capturing and treating a lot more water using a tree box filter than just a street tree. So there's a very distinctive difference between the two. And that'll become more clear later on in the presentation. Infiltration, infiltration trenches and galleries. Uh, this is a trench, as you can imagine, is just kind of a long system here, maybe four foot wide, four foot deep, full of stone, and it has a perforated pipe. So water can infiltrate into the gallery itself and then basically go through and it'll feed. This is uh, in Traverse City. So if you think about it this way, water that's going into this infiltration trench then is feeding the ground, which is then feeding these cypress trees, right? If we had catch basins here, the water would be conveyed to a pipe and it would be sheet flowed off to uh, the local stream and then into Grand Traverse Bay. So having a, a trench to capture that water and slowly infiltrate it is really beneficial to water quality. This can be done on a massive scale by having large scale galleries. So these systems can be replicated over a large area to promote infiltration. And uh, one of the techniques that we've been, actually we've been kind of pioneering, you're gonna see this later, is the idea of putting these infiltration trenches together with the stormwater tree box filters. So the stormwater will enter a catch basin and feed the tree box filter. Well, these tree box filters tend to be just individual units. However, you can really uh, expand between them with stone and that stone can serve as an underground reservoir that'll hold that water the street trees then will take that water and evapotranspirate it back up into the atmosphere. 
and then slowly over time infiltrate. You'll see examples of this from some work we did um, in Northport during the, um, when, when it gets to the implementation phase. Permeable pavements. So permeable pavements, you can have permeable asphalt. So this is a blacktop asphalt that is uh, almost like, it's like a, almost like a Rice Krispie treat in that you've got a lot of pore space and water can sheet flow through it. And contrary to popular belief, permeable asphalt actually works quite well in the winter time frames. This is from a site visit about 10 years ago now. But uh, even during cold weather, what happens is you get a little bit of thermal effect on this and the, uh, the openings allow that water to infiltrate and go into the ground. Porous concrete is basically very similar to permeable asphalt, except instead of being asphalt, it's, it's a concrete product. So here's a couple examples of, of concrete driveways and walkways. And then finally, concrete block pavers. So this, instead of being a, a, a poured concrete or asphalt, you have individual concrete paver blocks. So here's a couple other examples of it. Okay, transitioning now to the uh, Lake Charlevoix watershed. So, sorry, it's a little cranky on the back side here. Um, transitioning over the Lake Shalaboy watershed, we worked with three different communities, Shalaboy, East Jordan, and Boyne. Okay. So Boyne City to start with. So what you're going to see here, this is going to be kind of a consistent pattern. So this is going to be kind of a consistent pattern. What you're going to see is a map of the community. And then um, each of these are individual specific locations where green stormwater infrastructure could be implemented. And then the other idea, uh, I think I'll set the stage with a couple other things. So one is that these are just ideas, concepts, and recommendations. They're not formal and form, uh, formal plans at this point. So um, we have worked with the communities for some of the preliminary planning, but I don't want anyone to construe these as being ready to construct shovel ground ready projects. There'd be a lot more that would have to go into this before uh, a decision could be made on, on whether or not to move forward. In addition, these, I, these locations we've identified and rendered out are good um, opportunities for these projects to be implemented. However, this concept could be, uh, could be replicated in many other locations. So just because you don't see a specific dot or a bullet or location doesn't mean that you couldn't do a rain garden or a bioretention cell other places in the downtown environment. And hopefully that'll become more clear as we move forward. All right, so first of all, let's look at downtown Boyne. So downtown Boyne, we specifically rendered out four locations. And this is a really good example where the things we're rendering out could really be implemented at a lot of locations throughout the downtown. So let's start with site one. So site one is a, kind of a, a classic, what we would call a curb um, extension. So you've got your bump out or your area of grass at the corner that kind of pulls away from the parking before you get to a uh, crosswalk. And you can see here in the foreground, the um, retention basin or the catch basin. And so stormwater typically comes down the gutter, the curb gets in this catch basin and then gets discharged to the river and then into Lynch Charlevoix. Now this would be where you would do a curb cut, direct that water through some stones to get some turf, uh, to kind of slow it down a little bit, kind of capture some of the trash or the sediment. And then you've got the native plants in the background that soak up that water, infiltrate that water, and for larger storm events, this black thing in the middle here is an actual overflow structure. So that's where that becomes the catch basin now where the water will ultimately get to. Here's an alley. So this is an existing alley downtown. Alleys can be an excellent location for, uh, for basically capturing and storing water underground. And so here's a proposed uh, green alley. And so in this case, the actual areas where the tires typically would go, where you might have a little bit more wearing, you know, that would be impermeable surfaces. And then the porous pavers um, in the middle is where the water would infiltrate in and then soak into the ground. And you can use a variety of techniques for porous pavement, but we just happen to show one example here, which is the concrete block paver systems. This is a, a roadside swale. So in this situation, you have very, very large right of way. Um, so that all this grass area here is within the, the right of way. And so this turf grass here it has to be mowed, it has to be manicured, it has to be treated. Well, it's a great opportunity to, to maybe take some of this road runoff and move it into the swale. So this could be a curb cut and then a depressional area that the water will flow into and then have the catch basin in the swale instead of up on the road. So one thing you could do is, is again, having mowed turf grass, but this can be converted into kind of native flowering planter beds or even that'd be a semi-formal situation or it can even be kind of a, a native wildflower garden. 
So you need to also, in a, um, all of these things would kind of ha um, help capture and treat water. So you have to kind of balance aesthetics with public use, with water quality. So um, the deep root of native plants are going to provide better water quality benefits, and they are going to provide habitat for pollinators. A lot of people consider them to be beautiful. Uh, regular lawn is really not very uh, conducive for water quality benefits. So we are we do encourage people to transition lawn over to native prairie plants opportunities. However, you know, if, if they're um, having a grass line swale is still better than doing nothing but pipes and gray infrastructure. So there's three different opportunities here. And, and when the uh, live demo happens uh, at the end of the presentation, you'll get to see, um, you know, you'll get the opportunity to comment on these different techniques. So uh, here's an area we found near the river where there'd be an opportunity for, uh, for sheet flow runoff from the parking lot to be captured in, in a rain garden and perhaps do some additional native plantings along the water's edge. So moving over to Peninsula Beach, Peninsula Beach uh, also has several really good opportunities for stormwater capture. And so what we really look for in places like Peninsula Beach is grass, turf grass areas that are not being utilized, right? So a lot of turf grass areas serve a purpose. They may be for soccer fields. They may be for picnicking, um, firework watching on, on years that you have fireworks. So um, we don't necessarily advocate for all turf grass to be converted. But if you have areas or underused areas of turf grass, that would be a good opportunity to maybe convert it into natives. And then we also will look for catch basins. So any place you have a low-lying catch basin that directly connects asphalt to the water, we're going to try to intercept that. Right, and so you'll see that in these two examples from Peninsula Beach. So here's a catch basin. So all of this uh, debris and sediment and garbage comes off of the parking lot, gets into this catch basin, and gets transported straight into Lake Charlevoix. Really good opportunity to capture that water, let it slowly infiltrate through these native plants. We've chosen kind of a, a, an attractive plant palette here. Um, the, the stone around the edge obviously will keep people from driving into it or plowing into it. And then also the stone on the edge uh, will intercept kind of the sand, right? Because the sand can really clog up rain gardens. So if we have excess of sand, like you do in a lot of coastal environments, you want to provide a place where we can capture that sand and relocate it instead of clogging or choking out species. And then this is the other place. This is a, a, a rain garden. Or this is a circle, an existing circle that's being mowed. It's really a great opportunity to have a really a beautification project, a highly visible beautification project that'll capture the runoff from the, the parking lot. Rotary Park, this is an area that um, currently doesn't have any stormwater infrastructure, currently has some flooding issues, high water issues, as well as uh, non-pavement. So this would be an opportunity where if this park gets additional use or we move to a situation where we start uh, seeing pavement, we would encourage people to use concrete paver blocks, porous pavers, and native 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 grasses along the edge to try to capture and, and treat that water when this becomes more form, uh, more of a formalized park. And then finally, the last site we're looking at uh, is Tannery Beach. And so Tannery Beach is another example of like a roadside swale. So one of the things I mentioned early on, I'm just going to reiterate before I move on to the next community, is that we look for opportunities and we've rendered out um, in this case, eight different opportunities, but these strategies could be replicated across the entire region or across the entire community. So in this situation, you've got a curb and this water is capturing um, the water off the entire parking lot is being, I'm sorry, the entire roadway is being captured by the curb and gutter and then being directed to this pullout area and dumped straight into Lake Charlevoix. So we see an opportunity to curb cut, have that water be directed into it, kind of purify it as it goes through some plants and then overflow into the lake. So um, ultimately, it does end up in the lake, but it goes through that filtration process first, and that's really important for water quality, as, uh, as Madeline was mentioning during her talk. And the same thing, you know, you can either have, you know, grasses or flowering plants, or there's opportunities for um, herbaceous species or, you know, somewhat larger trees and, and native uh, bushes as well. So moving on into our, our next community, Charlotte Boy. So uh, I know we really would like people to think about each community separately, but the other idea is you can actually comment as uh, actually later on all three communities. So even if your community uh, community was boring, 
don't stop paying attention, right? There's some really good opportunities you might see in Charlevoix or East Jordan, and there may be opportunities to also implement these concepts in your community. So I just want to make sure people don't tune out just because I'm no longer talking about their specific city. So let's talk about Charlevoix now. So Charlevoix, we really kind of focused on three different areas uh, when we sat and met with the community leadership and we thought about where we could uh, look at um, kind of two areas along uh, Lake Charlevoix, kind of one area around downtown and then a little bit of the, of the neighborhood here to the north. So the first part would be a depot park. So depot park actually receives a lot of stormwater runoff from the roads um, along the parking lot of the roads. And then actually get some stormwater runoff from the uh, neighborhood up above the hill there. There's a series of catch basins and pipes that also spills out into this area. So you can see right here, we've got a, a parking lot. We have a catch, uh, we have a curb cut area here. So water's already kind of going in this low depressional area. So this is already serving a little bit like an infiltration basin rain garden. We think there's an opportunity to really kind of beautify it, right? So either using more of a, a non-formal mixture of natives, or a more formal planting native. So an opportunity to beautify the park, create public interest, and then also uh, kind of maybe educate people about the benefit of natives instead of just mowed turf grass. And then in this one here, uh, there's a pipe right here. And so this pipe goes into this kind of very, kind of low swale area when it's really wet, it's very hard to mow, hard to take care of. It's draining the building, the depot behind it, as well as the parking lot perfect opportunity to intercept that into a rain garden situation. Purify that water, cleanse that water, beautify the park, provide habitat, all the things we really want to accomplish in, in coastal communities. So moving down into Ferry Beach, uh, for those of you who are familiar with uh, Ferry Beach, it's also the site of the boat launch. Um, this area with the current high water levels associated with the Great Lakes and subsequently Lake Charlevoix, presents some uh, unique challenges, but also perhaps some unique opportunities uh, for um, restructuring the shoreline between human use and native uses. So here's the, the shoreline. You can see the water is actually already kind of moving up into the turf grass. So this is an area that's being mowed, it's being trimmed. And uh, it's really an area that even though there's a couple park benches, isn't getting a tremendous amount of traffic. So we don't want to take away these benches. We don't want to take away the opportunity for people to interact with the water. But we do believe there's an opportunity for some native shoreline in here. So you could put in either some more uh, kind of native wild areas and just have the occasional spot where somebody could sit and look and, and look through here. These are not high growing natives. You can actually look over the top of them still. Or it can be more formal or it could have bushes and trees, but any of these combinations would uh, be better than turf grass for this area when you think about water quality. In uh, situations like this, there is a catch basin right here, and this catch basin then kicks the water and just dumps it into the park, and this is actually a very low lying kind of wet area because of that. Um, we understand this is handicap parking. What we would propose is just sliding the handicap parking over to a couple stalls just immediately to the east. But this corner area here is really a great opportunity to get rid of some, um, you know, basically remove a little bit of impervious surface, take a couple parking spots away here, relocate into another part of the parking lot, and then capture that water through a curb cut near the front and have it slowly work its way through these plants and then into the overflow structure before going out. Okay, and kind of, repeat of repeating the theme. Capture water from parking lots and roads, infiltrate into the ground, filter it through plant roots and media, then discharge it cleaner than it was when it entered and at less volume than it was when it once entered. Along the way, we look for opportunities for beautification as well as habitat. So this is uh, the Ferry Beach wetland area and it, it's really right now mowed turf grass, but it's really quite wet. And so I think um, there's an opportunity here to maybe dry up some other areas of the park and make them more usable by humans, right? So as I said, we're not recommending converting an entire park to all wetlands, but we wanna maybe um, convert a portion of it, right? So maybe we can dry out some areas of the park for picnicking, volleyball, and other areas kind of convert to wetland habitat. So excavate out some areas, dry up other areas, and then create kind of native-based opportunities for uh, people to interact with these proposed wetlands. 
So moving downtown, we have uh, three sites we rendered downtown that these can be kind of replicated in other areas. So the first one is the, um, an alleyway, a very popular alleyway with uh, good restaurants, bars, and shops. Um, we want to, um, one of the things about green stormwater infrastructure and community visioning is there's frequently a strong public component to it, right? A, a strong placemaking component, right? So we want to capture and treat stormwater, which this alley currently does not do. The downspouts from these buildings, you know, directly connect into the storm sewer system. You can see them off the back of the building and go straight into Lake Charlevoix. So you're not getting any capturing and treatment of stormwater. So what is our opportunity to not only capture that stormwater, but, but pre, uh, create public space and create opportunities for placemaking? And so we envision that this could be completely uh, kind of renovated or restored. You can have stormwater planter boxes at the bottom of each downspout. These planter boxes can be color coded to buildings. And uh, this is a florist right here. So we can work with types of uh, native species that might fit in or culturally significant species. So now the downspouts connect to these planter boxes. The pavement becomes uh, porous or pavers, so we don't have as much runoff. And so we can create a beautification as well as stormwater treatment. This is going to be looking similar to uh, Ferry Beach. Here's your, your stormwater catch basin in the corner. So yeah, your opportunity exists to slide the pavement or slide the handicapped parking over and create uh, one or two parking stalls into pile retention basin. So here the water comes along the gutter into an inlet, goes through the plants, and then still overflows into the stormwater system behind. And then finally, we talked a little bit before about street trees and tree box filters. So the other thing with street trees, right, as I mentioned, they um, only treat the water that falls on them. Well, if not enough water falls on them, they also need supplemental watering and a lot of you know, supplemental care. If you use roadway runoff that gets filtered through a special media, you're actually watering the trees a lot uh, quicker as well. So when we look for dead zones like this, it's really a good opportunity to put in a stormwater tree, right? So a tree box filter. So now the water goes into the inlet here, feeds those tree roots underneath and it promotes a healthier environment. And finally, the Elm Street tennis courts. So a lot of the park areas and kind of the neighborhood areas in North Charlevoix would have opportunities to be retrofit, right? We're looking for places where maybe uh, there's an informal junction between the road and the grass, you know, areas that are like, this is an area of turf grass that's really not being utilized uh, as much as perhaps other parts of the park. So we can kind of formalize that edging and, and put in rain gardens. So final communities, East Jordan, as far as the rendering goes, then we'll talk about implementation for about 10 minutes. So East Jordan, we've got the schools, we've got the downtown, and we've got a couple sites on the west side. So starting with the downtown, so here's our existing downtown. Uh, we think there's an opportunity here for a mid-block crosswalk. You know, this is an area where pedestrians are kind of cutting across the road anyway. So we, we think is we can put a mid block crosswalk, have a couple curbed bioretention pump outs there, capture that water, treat that water, um, provide beautification for the downtown and give opportunities for pedestrians to kind of safely cross uh, where they're not stepping out from in between parked cars, which is a much more, if you had large parked cars on the street, it'd be much more dangerous for pedestrians. Um, downtown East Jordan has raised planter beds with trees. So these types of trees then really require supplemental watering because they, they're not getting any runoff into them. And so this is an opportunity to maybe lower those two at grade, lower those to at grade, beautify the walkway. So stormwater runoff now would go into the uh, tree box filter. And this is kind of a cutaway of how it works, right? So water goes into the catch basin, feeds the filter media from underneath, and then promotes the root growth and then slowly infiltrates into the ground. Large right of way, and again, we're gonna be starting to see a theme, long road, long gutters, water going straight to Lake Charlevoix, curb cut, capture that water, pull it into a bioretention area, rain garden, treat it and then release it back into the street for overflow. Echo Street Park, Another opportunity for some informal areas here, a lot of turf grass being mowed, understand that there needs to be parking along here for the Little League games, understand we need access for maintenance equipment, but there's still a lot of grass here that could be converted into native prairies. And then let's go ahead and formalize that parking and formalize the access along the way. 
And then finally, John and Jordan streets uh, on the other side of the river here. So here's a, an intersection. This is kind of a large five-way intersection, lots of extra asphalt here. So we think there's an opportunity to get rid of some imperviousness, right? So one of the, we talk a lot about impervious surface, like roads, parking lots, um, roofs. These things all create stormwater runoff that's polluted. So the simplest thing we can do is try to limit the amount of impervious surface. So here, we're gonna do two things. We're gonna A, get rid of impervious surface, and B, we're gonna capture and treat stormwater runoff uh, from areas uh, from the surrounding roads. So instead of a five-way intersection, we have two intersections, and then all the drainage from this whole area can go into a, a single rain garden before going into uh, a newly proposed kind of underground pipe system. So here's some of the roads in this area. Um, no formalized stormwater in this area, stormwater drainage. So when this area is ready for uh, redevelopment or ready for infrastructure replacements, that's when these types of techniques are going to be helpful, right? We don't necessarily advocate or argue for ripping up good functioning infrastructure. What we're saying is once infrastructure is at the end of its life cycle, at the end of its opportunity, let's rethink how we do it next time. And so you could have porous pavers along the edge, right? And the porous pavers can capture that water. It can be held in a stone reservoir and then slowly infiltrate into the ground. Or if you don't, uh, you know, pavers are kind of expensive. Uh, you may not like the uh, look of them. You can actually do slot drains. And then slot drains do the same thing. Capture that water, put it into a stone infiltration trench and infiltrate into the ground. Or you can have roadside twales consisting of native plants or grass. And then uh, moving to the other side over to the East Jordan schools, we really love working with schools because working with schools, you get the opportunity for basically native-based education. So schools can take green stormwater infrastructure concepts and they can put it into their biology curriculum. They can put it into their, um, you know, they're kind of, they actually have uh, AP classes on, on wetlands and things of that nature nowadays. So there's a lot of opportunities for stewardship, environmental stewardship as well as education associated with this. So we really like to see schools, you know, look for opportunities to maybe implement community gardens or implement rain gardens um, at downspouts or underutilized areas. Gives the students really kind of a sense of pride. And this is a really good example of a very large mowed turf grass area, not really serving a function or a purpose. This could be a native prairie, promote pollinator habitat, promote ecosystem services, or it could be still native plants, but maybe a more formal garden since it is the front entry way to the school. Or maybe it's just uh, you lower the turf grass a little bit, take water from the parking lot off, and then plant like a native tree grove. So any of these things would be kind of an improvement from a water quality point of view. So um, I'm keeping track of time here. I'm about 30 minutes in. I've, I've made my way through the three communities that we've done our visioning for. I'm going to take about 10 more minutes before turning it back over to the water. Um, I'm going to say, uh, before turning it back over to Tip of the Mint. And we're going to talk about two implementation projects. Uh, these projects were done uh, in conjunction with the Watershed Center of Grand Traverse Bay. So the Watershed Center of Grand Traverse Bay, they were the fiduciary. They held the grant money that funded these projects. The um, communities were obviously engaged because they became the owners of the green stormwater infrastructure that was designed. So the communities took ownership of the infrastructure that was funded through the grants. And then Drum and Carpenter served as both the uh, implementation, uh, we, we did the design and implementation, but we also did the community visioning to help uh, coalesce around concepts or ideas. So it was really, we're gonna start with the implement, we're gonna start with the, uh, the community visioning part of it and show you how it, it turned out. So uh, Northport, as, um, as you might imagine, so Northport, as the crows flies, is pretty close to Lake Charlevoix. It takes a heck of a lot longer to drive there. So if, if you're not familiar with Northport, I'll just give you a couple quick things, right? So here's the school. This is Naganaba Street, which is kind of the main downtown. Uh, this little jog in the middle here is an MDOT road. And then you've got the, the marina down here on uh, Grand Traverse Bay. And so this kind of this represents the village offices and their downtown, which you know, so uh, quite a kind of a typical small northern Michigan community, I would say, lakefront community. And you got parks along the water, uh, waterfront here. Right, so this is what downtown looks like, right? And so uh, extremely wide streets, no stormwater infrastructure at all. When it rains, water comes from the neighborhood way up on the hill here and just streams right down the road 
right into the marina and right into Grand Traverse Bay. Um, and it's basically polluted stormwater runoff. And then you can obviously see you've got a grocery store, um, some restaurants, and those are features I'll show um, in a little bit. So I do have some examples of that. So we happen to be uh, in the field uh, meeting with people during one of these very, very quick brief rainstorms, but even a quick brief rainstorm just sends a tremendous amount of water running down this hillside here. Um, this was an intense rain, but it wasn't like a 100 year flood or a 25 year flood or anything of that nature. These size rainstorms are very, very common. And because there's no stormwater treatment, the area down by the waterfront receives flooding quite regularly. And then this is the marina. You can tell, see the storm has already stopped. It's already stopped raining. And you got this whirlpool feature here. So all the water from the city and the hillside came into the marina. And then it goes into the storm drain right here and, and whirls out before heading out to Lake Charlotte. So one of the things we did is the original thought was that um, it hoped to do a bunch of green stormwater infrastructure kind of in the marina in the park. And the problem with that is if you waited till all the water gets down to the water site, so one would be high water tables and rising lake levels made it so that green stormwater infrastructure down in the park and in the marina would not be effective. We needed to bring the green stormwater infrastructure up the hill and into the downtown so we could capture that water and get it to infiltrate before it made it to the marina, right? And so um, up by the village uh, offices, which is two blocks to the west off of my screen here, uh, we did an underground infiltration trench, but because um, that's not really exciting to look at, I'm not gonna show that part. So, oops, that one dog that doesn't like to pack somebody's outside. All right, so we're gonna look at the street sections here. So as I mentioned earlier, we've got very, very, um, wide streets in this area, so 17-foot lane streets, 10-foot parking stalls, and then sidewalks, right? And so we looked at this one block in Naganaba, and so we gave them several different alternatives. So what would you think about making this, uh, let's narrow up the traffic lanes and replace that extra, so the 17-foot lanes with 11-foot lanes, which are plenty wide enough for a downtown, and then put bioretention swales or, or bump outs in there. And then we gave the community some examples for rendering. Let me slide this over in case you can see that. All right, so that's maybe what this would look like. And I'm not going to go through all the renderings so that would take too much time, but we gave them you know, several different versions of, of what this might look like. Okay, so you, know, you can see you got some dilapidated infrastructure here. So maybe at the intersections, we put in bump outs and uh, put in swales. Another opportunity would be to leave the streets as large as they are, but put in uh, underground infiltration reservoirs. And so capture that water and just in, you know, store it underground and infiltrate it, right? So here's the long trench and you can just capture that water and infiltrate it underground. Okay. The issue with this is while it does capture and infiltrate the stormwater, it doesn't really provide any community value, benefit, beautification, or any of the additional services associated with other forms of green infrastructure, beautification, et cetera. So then the last one we gave them as a concept was tree box filters. How about narrowing the street up and lining this with tree box filters? And after several community meetings and discussions, they decided that's the direction they wanted to go. So from the library down, we used street trees because at this point we were at the flat lowland area near the lake where we weren't gonna get a lot of capture and treatment. Uh, we put in tree box filters across from the library up here the corner in the grocery store and then in between those tree boxes we put in the stone trenches so water would enter up here would basically flow through this whole system being captured along the way stored in that stone and then infiltrated right so this concept right here we implemented throughout downtown north Road and uh and on the street so just a couple of construction shots here is this tree box filter, right? Here's the, uh, the single tree box. You can see the stone uh, trench, of the stone that's gonna be going uh, reservoir in between. This is the post office in the back that'll become relevant in a little bit. This is an impermeable liner. So we did not want to um, have a lot of infiltration of stormwater along the sidewalk face or going into the basements of these buildings. So we put an impermeable liner along this entire side to make sure that water went vertically downwards and then this is one of those tree box filters. Um, you know, the stormwater goes in here, feeds the tree, and there'll be a tree here in a little bit. So this is the other side where this is the tree box filter, this is tree box filter. So underneath these concrete sidewalks, 
are those stone reservoirs I was just talking about. And then the, this is the library and the uh, post office on this side. And then, um, so I'm sorry, this is uh, construction in 2018 and these are 2020, right? So you can see the beautification at the much narrower street here. We've got brickwork in here. You've got the tree box filters here. And then this is the other side of the street. This is tree box filters. So people that are visiting downtown, it's, it's a more aesthetically pleasing downtown. And what they don't realize is that all the way along, um, underneath all these sidewalks is stormwater storage with that providing the water quality treatment. And these trees are only one year old, so they're gonna get bigger. Uh, the next one I'm gonna talk about is Elk Rapids, just down the road from Lake Charlotte Boy. So here we go. And so Elk Rapids, right, you've got Veterans Park on the waterfront, you've got the marina, and you've got the downtown area. So these are kind of the three areas we looked at. And so um, this is an example of a poster. Uh, one of the things that Jen mentioned at the very, very beginning is that these are typically in-person meetings. Um, and then Ashley from the Watershed Center is gonna show you how we've made them virtual. What I'm showing you here is an example of the poster that we did for Elk Rapids. So for Elk Rapids, we, um, we went into a community meeting, we met with people, we talked with people, and then we let them vote on these things in person. And so I'm gonna show you just a few of the renderings as an example, but you can see here, same concept, you got this mid-block crossway Mid-block crossways are wonderful opportunities to beautify your downtown and provide actually some pedestrian safety features. So that's, that's kind of what it looks like. Other parts of the downtown, we gave them the option of tree box planters. We gave them the option of permeable pavers. We looked at curved rain gardens. And then finally moving further down the marina, um, we have roadside rain gardens on River Street. We had naturalized detention and wetlands along the waterfront and other opportunities. And so what we did with the community like Elk Rapids is we also worked with the Watershed Center of Grand Traverse Bay, same concept. They were the uh, grant applicant, they were the fiduciary. The community is gonna take ownership of the green stormwater infrastructure, Drummond Carpenters, the design team. And, and so what we did is we listened to the community we found out which types of green stormwater infrastructure techniques they were interested in. As I, you know, when we went to Northport, Northport did not want rain gardens downtown, right? They did not want trench drains. They wanted street trees and they wanted tree box filters. It met the needs of their community, right? And so we also then talked with Elk Rapids and we gave them different options and ideas and uh, they went a different way, right? And so, oh, sorry, one more rendering. Uh, we also looked at the renderings along, um, we looked at the uh, bioswale taking an existing kind of grassland swale and turning it into a naturalized detention swale. It could be either kind of like a Northern Michigan naturalized wetlands or it could be kind of more formal planting. And so um, with the idea of what the community wanted and what the grant could pay for. And so we kind of coalesced around basically two different bio swales up along the marina. Um, We've worked on this project up here in conjunction with uh, Ohio Sea Grant and Michigan Sea Grant, and then uh, rain gardens along River Street. So we've got the River Street rain gardens here, we got the marina bioswales here, and then um, I'm gonna talk about another project, but they didn't, um, a lot of the uh, green stormwater infrastructure we proposed for downtown was gonna be either too disruptive to the uses of the downtown or too expensive to implement. So. These are the ones that the, uh, the grant funding, this was uh, through a national uh, wildlife, uh, NFWF grant funding opportunity. And so this is the bass whale. So this picture was taken earlier this week by Rachel. So she's uh, on site doing construction site for us. So we uh, curb cut the infiltration, right? We curb cut, oh, um, sorry, we curb cut the parking lot. We're directing it into this bass whale. We got rid of the turf grass. We're planting this with all native species. And uh, this will be wrapped up here in the next couple of weeks. The next project we're going to be implementing in 2021 is on Cedar Street, right? So I already mentioned you know, we've got a River Street downtown. But what we did is we went around the corner from downtown onto Cedar Street. And so there's a main stormwater line that comes right down Cedar Street and then dumps into the marina. So we're going to intercept that line here. And we're going to be putting in uh, infiltration trenches here. And then the side streets over here is going to have curved bioretention. So we're going to do some bump out curved bioretention as pretreatment, and then a large scale infiltration trench under Cedar Street before it dumps out into the, uh, the marina. And so I'm going to stop sharing. According to my timer, I'm at my 45 minute mark. 
And I'd be more than happy to uh, answer any questions if Ashley or Jen would like to moderate. We haven't received any in the chat box. Um, and in the interest of time, I think uh, we're just going to move on to Ashley's portion of the presentation. But I also want to emphasize to those of you um, still in attendance, I would love it if you guys have questions and you want to reach out to um, either Ashley or myself with the tip of them at Watershed Council. If it's a question for Don, we'll make sure that um, we direct it to him or if we can answer it. Uh, answer it ourselves. So um, there's always an opportunity to ask questions. So we'll, we'll do that. So um, I just now want to kind of move on to Ashley. She's going to walk us through what we've developed for this project. Again, kind of in lieu of doing the um, in-person uh, work that we had hoped to, but as a way of hopefully, you know, not only reaching you, but making sure that we can reach others um, through our ArcGIS story map, which Ashley will introduce, and our survey that's going to be open for our uh, community members in each of the three cities. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ashley. All right. Well, thank you all. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, my, my name again is Ashley Sotishek. I'm the Watershed Policy and Program Coordinator for Tip of the Mitt Watershed Council. Um, I am hopeful that you can all see my screen here. Um, this is just a, a quick snapshot of one of the things that you probably found in the chat. Um, I shared two links with you all. Um, one is just a link to this PDF document, um, which is a, a quick fact sheet that you can print um, or share with others. Um, that, that tells you a little bit more about the green storm water infrastructure practices that Don referred to earlier. Um, and then the second thing that I'm going to show you, which was the other link in the chat, um, is the, the Lake Charlevoix green storm water infrastructure visioning um, story map by ArcGIS. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick run through of the, the story map itself, and then we'll show you a little bit more about voting opportunities. So if you scroll through this first bit here, um, this first section actually has some buttons. If you wanna cheat and, and jump to your cities right ahead, um, you, could, you could click on these buttons and they will take you to each of the voting opportunities that are available for each of the three cities. Um, as we move on in the story map, the next section um, actually highlights a green storm water infrastructure opportunity for residents of the Lake Charlevoix watershed. Um, if you simply click on this link that's within this story map, it will take you to a Google form that you can fill out and request um, a site visit to come um, have someone from Tip of the Mitt come out and look at your property um, and, and offer recommendations for practices for green stormwater infrastructure that might, um, might be helpful. So you can fill out that quick form. Jumping back to the story map here, um, the, the first bit is just an introduction to the Lake Charlevoix watershed. I'm not going to read all of this, um, but, but we'll leave it to you all to run through it. Um, but it gives you some helpful history and background for, for potential threats to the watershed now um, and in the past. So a lot of interesting content here to learn about the challenges that, that face this watershed. As we move on, um, we, we kind of quickly tonight gave you a taste of, of the benefits of green stormwater infrastructure and some of the practices that are available to us. Um, but this really lays out in depth each of the different practices that can be utilized. Um, things like porous pavements, rain gardens, green belts, bioswales, and the like. Um, so you can, you can read more here. Again, I know we're a little pressed for time and I want to make sure I go through the surveys for you all. Um, but there's a lot of great content here. Um, and then this is just a little bit about each of our organizations and funders. So I'm gonna click this button and pop back to the top here. Um, and I'm gonna choose uh, Boyne City as my test, uh, test city to show you how the survey works. So if I clicked that button, it would actually take me to, to this page here, which is the page that is specific to Boyne City 
Um, it, it will run through each of the practices that, that Don has highlighted for us this evening. Um, so for example, that first uh, River Street bioretention curb extension um, is depicted here. And in, in each of these are, are shown throughout the story map. So you'll go all the way to the bottom, or again, if you're impatient like me, um, you can just click on the survey link and that will take you all the way to the bottom here. Now, I have already popped out, um, I've clicked on it to interact and have popped it out into a different page, um, but you could certainly just take it um, within your own browser, but I'm gonna show you on the separate tab. So, this is the survey and, and we encourage um, all residents or visitors for Boyne City to, to take it. Um, the, the reason that you would want to is so that you can help us to prioritize which of these projects to pursue in the future. Um, you know, let us know if something isn't right for your community or if you really love an idea. Um, we really want to get feedback. As Don said, each of the, the communities has had that they've worked in have had um, different feedback and, and kind of different character of the communities. And so um, we want to make sure that each of these are tailored correctly to your community. So the first question um, just has to do with your connection to Boyne City, East Jordan or Charlevoix, whether you live or work there, um, if you live in a nearby community and just visit there, or if you vacation in Boyne City, or if, if you're not a resident or visitor, but just very interested in green stormwater, um, infrastructure in, in each of these places. So next, you're gonna see this quick um, graphic here, which shows you all of the proposed practices. It might be useful to have a pen and paper um, to be able to go through each of these and make sure, um, and, and be able to kind of rank your choices or make any notations about what you like or don't like. Um, these are not clickable here, um, but, but I'll show you how we're gonna have you offer your feedback as we've you know, again, adapted this presentation format um, to be all online. So with the first one here, you can see that there are a series of buttons that we're, that you're gonna click. So if, if you really love proposed number one on River Street, then you would say, yes, I love it. Um, if you only like it, um, maybe, maybe have a, a couple gripes about it, but, but largely like the idea and like the aesthetic, um, you click this button. If you like the idea of, of a bioretention curb extension, um, but you just think River Street's the wrong place for it, you'd click that button. If you don't like the appearance of, of what we've got there, maybe the plant palette doesn't appeal to you um, or, or something else, you could say, you know, maybe you, you're open to the concept, but you dislike the appearance. Or this final choice is, nothing about this works for you. Um, you, just, you just don't like it. So, so we're gonna have you go through and rate those choices for each of them. Um, and in each community, there are between eight and I believe 10 of these different proposals. Um, so, so go through each of those and for each one, you know, click and, and tell us how you feel about the concept. Moving on, you'll actually rank the, the concepts, um, which will be really helpful in helping us to prioritize which of these projects to pursue in the future um, and, and let us know, you know your favorites or, or the ones that you don't love. So for example, if you really loved what was proposed for the swale on Tannery Beach, um, you can move that to the top of the list. Um, if you weren't you know, a fan of the alley, you could move that to the bottom. Um, and so forth. So if, if you make a mistake, you can always, you can move them around after you've moved them once, um, but you could fully reset that um, just by hitting that button. It won't reset the whole form. It will just reset this section. Next, um, for some of them, different aesthetics have been proposed, um, you know, for for I believe for this community, numbers three and number eight um, had a couple different concepts that were proposed that you could choose from. And so we want you to, to point us in the right direction. Um, so for proposed three, um, you can see this is the existing condition. This is the condition with just a little bit of turf grass, but obviously we've got a curb cut here. Um, for proposed three B, this is a little bit more manicured. Um, where, where this one is loosely organized flowering plants. 
Um, so kind of different looks that are achieving similar outcomes. If you really like, um, we'll, we'll say this more wild version, um, you can click there. Um, and, and so we want you to pick which one, um, which one would be your preference. And then explain here um, in 255 characters or less, so just a, a few words or sentences um, describing why you chose that concept. Um, and, and you could also say why you did not choose another one. So the same sort of thing here um, is shown for concept eight. This is the Tannery Beach location, the existing condition here. Um, this is a more formal planting with some native grasses versus one um, with some shrubs um, along with some grasses. So again, you can choose which of these you find most aesthetically appealing. Um, make your selection and then write a few words in the comment box um, to, to let us know why you chose what you did. Finally, there are just a couple questions here to gauge um, your, your feelings on green stormwater infrastructure in your community. Um, if you want to see more of these practices applied, you would click that you strongly agree that you'd want to see more of those in your area. Um, if you disagree, obviously that's the opposite end of the spectrum. And then our second question at the end um, is just, do you feel that green stormwater infrastructure is important to improving the water quality in Lake Charlevoix? Um, and so obviously since, since we're with Tip the Mitt, I'm gonna say that we strongly agree on both of these, um, but you can make your, your selection um, here at, at the end of your survey. And then at the end, we have another comment box that you are welcome to share any additional feedback. Um, maybe there are other areas in your community that should have green stormwater infrastructure. Um, maybe, you know, you, you just want to elaborate on one of your previous comments. Um, we, we welcome all of that feedback. And when you're finished, you just hit submit. And so we will be accepting these comments through December 1st. Um, we'll, we'll have this open and we'll we'll probably continue to share these links again with you. Um, but, but certainly um, really welcome your participation. Hope that you share it on social media and, and just value your time being here tonight.